what we like. All right, we're going to continue this series today, uh, sort of getting to the end of this, Grace, Gratitude, and Gravy, where we're making our way through what a lot of people think is the, one of the most gratitude-filled books uh, in the New Testament, and that's the book of Philippians. Well, most of us, are, I think, are familiar with that uh, idea of paying it forward, where you kind of give today in anticipation of uh, how that gift is going to, you know, be applied or used down the line. Now, one of the most, I think, iconic or maybe famous stories of paying it forward happened a few years ago. It's a true story where a, a lady went up to the Starbucks line. You know, she was in the drive through and she paid for her drink, and she just said, you know, I'm going to pay for the guy behind me, too. So when he got up there, his drink was free, and he said, well, that's cool. I'm going to pay for the one behind me. And this went on for 397 customers. On and on and on, all day, people were paying for the person's drink behind them. And it's just that idea that, you know, when we acknowledge the grace, you know, we receive a little grace, we re- turn it with a little gratitude, and that just goes on and on and on, kind of like a ping-pong effect that just goes on and on and ends, you know, we don't know where it's going to end. It could just keep going on and on and on. Well, we've been talking about that this last uh, few weeks, how it is that when we begin our day, we begin our day with that kind of baseline gratitude to God for the life that He gives us for the love that we are able to receive and able to give. When we start with real gratitude, just for that, just for those two things, well, it begins to seem like everything else that we receive, all of, you know, the goodnesses and the kindnesses and the, and the blessings that we receive after that just seem to pile up on top of that baseline of gratitude. And it seems like everything else that we receive that day is just gravy. Everything is just blessings that, you know, we may not have expected that just keep piling up on top of that love and that, that life that God has given us. So as we continue to, to look at that, uh, it's good to just remember that we're in that kind of place. We're in that kind of place of gratitude. And we can be there anytime, no matter what's going on in our lives. In other words, no matter where we're at in our lives, physically, emotionally, mentally, physically, relationally, we all have struggles, we all have things going on, but still, if we begin with that baseline of gratitude for God's life that He's given us and the love that He gives us, well, we can even get through all of those things. In fact, we can begin uh, to remember at that point that God is actually with us no matter where we're at in our lives. Even when we're struggling, God in His love wants to be located there with us wherever we're at. And that's especially true, as we talked about last week, when the struggles that we're experiencing are coming to us because of our faith in Jesus, because we're standing up for our faith and we're taking a little bit of heat for that faith, Uh, still we can be grateful for that. You remember last week, Paul was telling the Ephesians or the Philippians that they were, you know, receiving a little heat for their, their faith in Christ. And it said it, he said, it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him. So in that moment, even in those times when we are taking a little bit of heat uh, for our belief in Jesus, for our faith, we can uh, be grateful for that and understand that that is actually a gift from God. It's a moment where we can begin to clarify for ourselves what's really important to us, why we do believe what we believe. So Paul says, even when we're suffering, for the sake of Christ, we can be grateful. And of course, that is exactly where Paul is as he's writing this letter to the Philippians. You'll remember, he's in prison in Rome, and he's there because he's been spreading the gospel. And along the way of spreading the gospel and his missionary work, he's been planting churches. So there are people, new believers out there. And even though Paul is in prison for his faith, these new believers uh, that he's introduced to the gospel, they've not forgotten about him. They've 
taken up collections for him. They've tried to get gifts to him, support for him while he's in prison. And they're doing this because they're so grateful to him him for having brought them into this new faith, this faith that's changing their lives. So they're supporting Paul even while he's uh, in prison. And there are actually people at this point who are uprooting their lives. They're actually going to Rome themselves just to be around Paul, just to be there and support him while he's in prison. Now, Paul talks about two of these people as we begin to move into the middle of chapter 2 here in Philippians. Two of these people, one's name is Timothy, and the other's name is Epaphroditus. Now, Timothy was kind of an odd uh, creature in the first century. He was a technically a third-generation Christian. Now, we need to remember this letter is written only about 60 years into the whole Christian movement, but he's a third-generation Christian because his grandmother... Uh, whose name was Lois, and his mother's name, uh, mother who was uh, Eunice, they were both Christians. They were Jewish people that converted uh, to Christianity. So Timothy was this young man who was steeped in the Old Testament Scriptures, uh, but also very dedicated to the gospel. And he was dedicated to the Apostle Paul. So he's one of these young men who went to Rome to support Paul. And he is so dedicated to Paul that Paul actually calls him my true son in the faith, which is kind of an amazing thing that Paul looks upon this young man who maybe was a little bit like Paul in that sense. Maybe he had that same sort of, you know, real intellectual power uh, for Christ. Maybe he had some of that deep concern that Paul had for the church. And uh, certainly, he had a great dedication to Christ. So, Paul calls him my true son in the faith. And he goes on to say that as a son with his father, Timothy has served me in the work of the gospel. So, this is a really important young man, a real staunch supporter of Paul. And he's right there at Rome with Paul. Well, Paul says the same sort of thing about Epaphroditus, another young man, and this man was actually sent by the church in Philippi to go and be with Paul and support Paul. And uh, uh, Paul says about him that he is my brother, my co-worker, and my fellow soldier. So you get this impression that, man, this must have been a really stellar uh, young man who's with Paul someone who's close enough that Paul would call him his brother, who's a co-worker and is a fellow soldier, like someone who would stand right next to Paul, maybe even lay down his life for the gospel or lay down his life for Paul. So Paul has these two staunch young people who are with him in Rome. They're working alongside him. They're giving him all of their support. But Paul... It's just, I mean, it's just the kind of person that Paul would want to have with him and that you might want to have with you uh, for a long, long time. But Paul, and this is where it changes, Paul uh, has said that he wants to send these two guys away. He wants to send them away. He writes to the uh, Philippians, he says, I hope that in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, very soon. And he says the same sort of thing about Epaphroditus. He says, I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. And the reason he wants to do that, though, is not because they're not valuable to him. Obviously, they are. It's not because they're not doing a great job. Obviously, they are. It's because Paul believes, Paul has incredible confidence That as much as these guys are valuable to him, they would be even more valuable or of more use to the church in Philippi. So he's willing to sort of step aside on his needs and send these guys, kind of pay them forward into this church in Philippi. 
He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I may be cheered, cheered. There we go. Yeah, that I might be, okay, this, there you go, thank you, maybe, uh, yeah. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I might be cheered when I receive news about you. He says, I have no one like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. In other words, Paul's saying, I want to send Timothy to you. Because someday I know he's going to come back to me and he's going to have all kinds of good stories about the successes that you've all had together. He's willing to send this young man who has so much concern for him to the Philippians because he knows he'll have that much concern for them as well. And that together they're going to build something fantastic. The same thing goes for Epaphroditus, even though it's on a little more of a personal note that, uh, can someone else just do this? Thanks. This is a, that's not it. There you go. He says, I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, in other words, they sent him, whom you sent to take care of my needs, for he longs for you. And is distressed because you heard that he was ill. And the thing about it was, he was very sick. And the people in Philippi are concerned about him. But Epaphroditus is concerned about them being concerned for him. And Paul is just concerned about everybody. So he wants to send Epaphroditus back to, to, to help them feel better, to help Epaphroditus feel better, and also said he can be that co-worker and fellow soldier along with that church. So the thing that begins to see in this section is that Paul and Epaphroditus and the Philippians, they're all trying to just kind of outdo one another to do for one another. You remember when Jesus says we all should do unto others as others would do unto us, as we would have others do unto us. That's what they're doing. They're outdoing themselves. They're outdoing one another in doing unto others. And that's kind of the key to this kind of Christian life in this early period. And I think uh, still goes for us today. You know, Paul had said before to these Philippians that they were united together in Christ, but they were united in receiving certain things. He said that they should be united together in receiving comfort from His love. In other words, united in understanding and believing that sins are actually forgiven and that uh, we have new life in Christ, and that we have eternal life in Christ. So that's a comfort from His love, and they're united in that. He says they should be united in a common sharing of the Spirit, that indeed, as they pull together as a church, they're motivated by the Holy Spirit. He said they should have a common sharing of tenderness and compassion. In other words, knowing that No matter what they're going through, no matter what those struggles are, that God is with them. God is giving them that tenderness, that compassion that they can also give to others. But Paul goes on to say there that if they have any encouragement in any of those things, if they're getting any good out of any of those things, they should make his joy complete by being like-minded. And then he goes on to describe what that is having the same love, being one in the Spirit and of one mind, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but looking to the interests of others. In other words, in that being united with Christ, They find themselves being in a place where they begin to look at others' interests above 
their own. They get into this mindset of trying to outdo themselves in doing unto others. And that's just a good thing for us to remember, especially today. You know, today we're going to be giving our our pledges. And the fact is, people began pledging in this church, paying forward in this church back in the 1920s. And they did that knowing that they were paying forward, giving forward, doing unto every one of us, even though they would never know us and never see us, they were giving forward uh, for us. And they did that with their gifts. And they did that with their service. The same way people do here today. You know, whenever we step up and we give our gifts, whenever we are serving on those committees, whenever we're playing music for one another, whenever we're teaching Whenever we're doing any of those things, we are also right now paying forward into the future of this church, doing unto the future of people that we will never know and maybe never see, but who will, just like us, get the benefit of all that has gone on before to be able to worship in this little corner of God's kingdom. We're sitting here because so many people before us have gone ahead and paid forward and have done unto you and me. And that's what we're called to do today too. We will be doing that very same thing, same way they did, and the same way that the Philippians and Epaphroditus and and Paul and Timothy have done for one another. Now, they were really, really good at this. And Paul obviously knows what he's talking about when he talks about not looking to our own interests, but looking uh, to the interests of others. Now, they're really good at it. But they still were not able to do everything for everybody all the time. And neither can we. But there is something that we can do. We can every single day choose you know, to do one thing, to actually get out of ourselves and do one thing that is completely not in our own interest but is in the interests of another. We can go ahead and choose to outdo ourselves, to do unto our husbands, to do unto our wives, our mothers, our fathers, our friends. We can choose to outdo ourselves doing unto this church and other places in the world. It's what we're called to do as Christians, to outdo ourselves in doing unto others, remembering that Jesus did that, that Jesus, being in the very nature God, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even Death on the cross. It's being united with Christ who gave his all for us that we can give unto and do unto others, even outdo ourselves doing unto others. Well, next week we're going to finish this up. We're going to be looking at how we can really respond in gratitude in practical ways. But this week, let's just remember that again, While we might not be able to do everything, we can all do something. We can all do something. To outdo ourselves, to do unto those who are around us, and pay forward in our love, not only here in church, but wherever we are. Amen?